some crazy speech on uh, math. Uh, <laughs> what was it? Are you stealing slides? What? Who, who's got it? What? What the fuck? Oh, right. Okay. Well, okay. Ha! <laughs> we'll start with. Uh, hi, Bill. We'll start with uh, the, the basics. All right. Uh, do you guys know what uh, big O notation is? Like everyone. Is there anyone who doesn't know? All right. Great. That's great. All right. Uh, do you guys know? Uh, this is going great. Do you guys know greatest common divisor and uh, the Euclidean algorithm? Yeah. Everyone? No. no. Okay. I can I can do Euclid's really quick. Uh, uh, okay. Euclidean algorithm. You got. You get. Everyone knows what the greatest common divisor of two numbers is, right? Okay. Uh, the Euclidean algorithm does that in log base 10 n. That's big O notation. I glossed over that before. And uh, the way it does it is, you take two numbers, let's call them A and B, and the bigger being A, and uh, you do A modulus B, and then the remainder goes into R, and then you shift those over so B becomes A and R becomes B, and do it again, and you keep doing that till R equals zero, and when you're done, B is the greatest common divisor. It's really fucking fast. Like, dog base 10 end, right? Great. Oh, uh, modular math. Do you guys... I want to be able to show this to you. What? Yeah, I'll pass it around. What? Ask if anybody just has a really long RCA patch cable. Does anyone have a really long RCA patch cable? Nick Farr wonders. This is great. Okay, well, modular, <laughs> modular math. Do you guys know what, like, if I were to say 27 is kind of growing to 3 modula 12, do you guys know what that means? <laughs> okay. It looks like, it looks like 27 and an equal sign with 3 bars, and then 3, and then a parenthesis, and then modula 12, and... It's written in, like if you're writing in C, it would be 27% sign, 12 equals 3. It's basically like, think of it like an if case statement. And, uh, I really need an overhead for this. Uh, because the next thing I was going to go over was Euler's Toten function. And, uh, that, it looks like a, it's the Greek character Phi. <laughs> Alright, someone try and make that work or do something. I don't, I don't know what the... <laughs> Alright, hey, did you find DT? Yeah, found DT. So what's up? Alright, well... Alright, well, they do, they do whatever. You guys have... Use your imaginations, okay? Uh... <laughs> What? Does does anyone have an RCA female to female gender changer? Because Nick Farr wants one. Yeah, why don't you sit in a chair here, do your scribbling, bounce figures on stage? I mean, you can. Someone figure something out. I don't care, but. Uh, on what though? What are we gonna write on? I'm not gonna type latex. <laughs> um. Yeah. Well. Uh, do, do you guys want to just what? To do what? Yeah, you do whatever you want. Move that shit around. I, I just, I just want you people to see this overhead. It's all I want. All right, set up a chair. Grab a tablecloth and try to give you a white background. What? That. 
So, what do you want me to do with the 10 minute break? You want me to entertain you? Do you, would, you like me, would you like me to sing? What? I can sing. Is that, is that all you people want? Alright, whatever. We'll skip over what's called a quantum bit. And, uh, alright, so there's lots of different ways to do that using physics and all sorts of other crazy stuff. But, uh, for the time being, just like whenever I talk about any quantum physics, just uh, forget all physics and imagine that it's magic, because it is. <laughs> and, uh, well, it is. And, uh, okay, first thing, uh, superposition. Uh, a quantum bit, like, it can be a zero or a one, or it can be what's called a superposition, which is in uh, in between state between the two. And it's only a one or a zero if it's a. <laughs> So it's only a one or a zero if it's already decohered, which is making no sense right now because I don't have any overheads. Uh, okay, so what's that? Couple minutes, great. Uh, what's up? What do you want? What do you want me to do? Tell me. I, I can sing. I can sing Peter Gabriel pretty well. It's it's a song I used to always sing. What, what do you want me to sing about? I'm gonna sing about what? I you guys are all talking. It's what? What? Oh. All right, I got a joke for you. All right, uh, so this this grasshopper he walks into a bar and uh, the bartender's like, "Hey, we got a drink named after you." And the grasshopper goes, "Really? You got a drink named Lenny?" <laughs> So, Very delicate operation. All right, is this a hacker convention or what? What's up? <laughs> All right, well, we, we we still have the problem that like I I wrote these while I was really fucked up last night, so. <laughs> but, all right. No, no, we're good. We're good. No, just don't, don't, don't die on that thing. And duck, duck. Yeah, great. Okay. What? What? This is good. This is good. Oh. Uh, well, so there. Uh. Yeah. So, um, uh, what, um, uh, <laughs> you've got great timing. What? Are we, are we gonna do this thing or what? No, we'll do the over. Just plug, plug that fucker in. All right, I'll start on this thing. All right, you guys can see that, right? Uh, all right, going back to math, all the way back. Uh, we glossed over Big O and all that shit. Uh, or just totem function. Basically, 5n, it's uh, the number of numbers that are between 1 and n minus 1 that are relatively prime. Do you guys know what relatively prime means? Okay, it's you know, greatest common divisor, yeah. Okay, and uh, so that's phi right there. And then Euler also had a theorem, which is uh, right there. If t and r are relatively prime to each other, and t's the bigger one, then uh, t phi r is congruent to 1 modulo r. Which means basically, if you take t, if you take t and you multiply it by itself, uh, phi r times, and uh, divide the result by r, you will always get one. So that's all that says right there. And uh, they're still doing overhead shit. So what that's used for is what the what in the. <laughs> No, 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 I, I, I remember what I was doing here. All right, check this out, check this out. Hey, give me, that, give me back that Euler's totem. 
Oh, quit moving that stuff around. All right, great. Check this out. Get All right. All right, great. Can I pull this mic off? Fuck up my note cards. Would you quit moving my shit? Alright. Uh, yeah, I know I'm gonna have to actually speak, huh? <laughs> Alright, so. Oh. <sighs> so we got the Oilers Totem Theorem, right? And uh, this is what RSA is based on completely, basically. So we start out with that theorem right there in general. And, uh,. Like by just basic math, we can multiply it by itself on both sides, right? Like, do you guys? What time is it? Do you guys really want to see me derive this or not? It doesn't matter. All right, no. Okay, that's great. The end product, just the RSA in general. All right, well, no, I'll, I'll do this fast. I'll do this fast. Yeah, just for you, Bill. If you guys don't know what I'm doing here, just stop me. Like, this combines. <laughs> All right, and you see how you can keep repeating doing this? Like, you just keep multiplying by T pi R, and since you're already doing it, since, since it's modular arithmetic, you can do that as many times as you want, and it doesn't matter because it's modulus, right? The third line has to be a plus. Where? The who? Oh, yeah, so, great. <laughs> no, he's right. And, uh, so, anyways, yeah, uh, so you get that, right? And you, so you can keep doing that, and let's call this an S, and that's any integer, right? So that's like a first modification to that. And then the second thing we do is we've got T, S, oh, multiply both sides by T, just gives us mod R. And then, like, we can keep, well, okay, so we got a times T here, times T at like exponential math, right? Great, right? Everyone got that so far? And then like like we did before, we can keep doing that. We can keep multiplying T by both sides. And uh stop moving. Yeah. So we can keep doing that and we can make this an E eventually. But really the one we want is the one with the uh plus one, because we can take T S Phi R plus one convert to T mod R. You still see that? Great. And uh, we take that, and then this part right here is what we're interested in. So we take that and we create. Take that and we create a. Uh, si All right, great. We say P times Q equals that, right? And uh, S Phi R plus one. So those are P and Q, which will be our two prime numbers that we generate a key with. So we substitute that in. And then from that we can get, this is going to be squeezed on. Great. They're uh, right here. Uh, Oh, over, right, great. Uh, 
Yeah, so there's a uh, there's your encryption and decryption algorithm, respectively, for RSA. Uh, basically, RSA works on, if you don't know the basic principles, it's, uh, it takes really big, uh, the, the product of two really big uh, prime numbers, and it, using that in Euler's totem uh, function, you can basically can do the inverse modulus of, you can do an inverse modulus operation, which is crazy if you think about it. And the encryption does the normal modulus, and the decryption does the inverse modulus, and it makes it really hard to decrypt because the only way you can do it is by guessing P and Q, which also happens to be the Euler totent function of uh, P minus 1 times uh, Q minus 1. All right, whatever. Uh, so that's RSA. What's this thing? That's, I don't want that. Uh, oh, we'll go over this. What else I can talk about? Oh, it really is quantum shit. Uh, all right, qubit. Uh, so I went over that a little bit. It's just a quantum bit. That's what it's called. Whatever, right? Uh, it, oh, superposition. Okay. With quantum bits, you can get... Uh, it can be a one, a zero, or something in between. And the something in between is called a superposition. And when something's in a superposition, it's got like a, let's say maybe a 75% chance of becoming a one, or and a 25% chance of becoming a zero. That's called a superposition. And uh, it has to do with like the way quantum mechanics works. Like I said, it's magic. Uh, you, well, I'll go to EPR state. EPR state stands for Einstein, Poldesky, Rosen, the, the guys who researched it. And that also has to do with entanglement a little bit. You get two qubits together, and you use a Bell state analyzer, and you check them out. And they will, um, you can get them so they're both in a 50-50 superposition. So it's got a 50% chance of becoming a 1 and a 50% chance of becoming a 0. And uh, that's called the EPR state, when everything's got equal chance of becoming whatever. Which leads us to decoherence, which is what becoming is. Uh, when something's in a superposition, it's you can't read the data. The second you read the data, it will snap into one of the positions, one or zero. That's called decoherence. And like if you're in an EPR state and you read the bit, uh, it will decohere to a 50% chance of being a one, a 50% chance of being a zero. And uh, <coughs> using that EPR state, you can, uh, oh, also with the EPR, <laughs> I glossed over this again, but uh, the entanglement between the two qubits that you have in EPR, uh, there's a control bit and the whatever not control bit, and uh, when you read one, the other one will decohere to the exact same value uh, based on what that is, and that's what entanglement is, and uh, it's pretty crazy like that. Like, let's say I decohere or I, I put two qubits in uh, EPR state, and I give one to, to him over there somewhere. <laughs> I give one to someone on the other side of the world. Uh, he reads his. The next time he reads his, it'll be the same value. It's like having a, it's like having two linked coins, and you flip it a bunch of times. As long as you know they're entangled, uh, and you get a sequence of heads, tails, tails, heads, whatever. The other one will do the same random sequence. Um, Oh, but anyways, with that you can create a controlled NOT gate, which is, you know, if you don't know what a controlled NOT gate, that's the way it maps. Uh, so you got your control bit. If it's on, it does a NOT to the second one. If it's not, it does nothing. And uh, you can make every other type of gate that you need out of that. Yeah, uh, any questions on that? Anyone? All right, no, great, that's perfect. Okay, so, what's all this... What's up? Where? Who? Yeah, go. Shout loud, please. Uh, this question was, are they teleporting with entanglement? No. The way those teleportation things work is they transfer the information using qubits, and they've still got to transfer uh, entangled photons, which, you know, it can only go speed of light or whatever. And uh, it's like a mapping of the information, and it rewrites it. Does that make Right. Balls. What? Oh, he said, what? Why? 
shut up. All right. So, any other questions on that? What? Go. Head, red hat person? Uh, so there are a couple ways to. Man, I'm not. Okay, well, there's a couple ways to do it. Uh, one way is you just read them with the Bell State Analyzer and they entangle with each other. Bell State Analyzer? Something Bell made up? <laughs> Does anyone have any? What's that? No, it's not at all. Let's. Uh, oh, he's got information about Bell State analyzers. Oh, entanglement. Right. Whatever. Same deal. Right. Right. No, you're right. But it doesn't matter for what I'm saying. Uh, like, does anyone have any questions that aren't like physics related? Like, this is this is an algorithm speech. <laughs> okay. All right. Great. So, what this is used for now, getting to algorithms, which I kind of oh, oh, glossed over, is um, remember I talked about RSA and uh, how factoring really big numbers. Oh, does everyone understand that factoring the product of two really large prime numbers is a hard thing to do? Yeah. <laughs> okay, just want to make sure. Uh, all right, uh, Peter Shore, he made this fun little algorithm that uh, will break RSA in two steps. RAR. Uh, basically, the way it works is you... Uh, oh, what end did I use? I had a demo example with all the math done out already, but I don't have a calculator on me. Hold on a second. Keep them entertained. What? Keep them entertained. Too bad. Too bad. Too I just put someone's calculator in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, so anyways. Okay, let's say our n is uh, 15, right? That's 3 times 5, they're both prime. It's really easy to do, simple for us, right? So uh, the first part of the algorithm is you choose an a, which is less than n. So let's say a equals 7, right? Then uh, we create a function called f of x. Uh, oh, I might have glossed over this also. Uh, <laughs> with quantum computers, uh, anything that you do with one qubit uh, is like a massively parallel operation to everything else. So basically, you can, let's say you've got two qubits, or yeah, two qubits entangled. You can do four operations at the same time on. It's two to the number of bits you have. So, anyways, you can, and a superposition can store that much data also, two to the number of qubits you have entangled. So, uh, two qubits entangled can store uh, four, I guess, lines or superpositions of information. So, what you do is first you load up everything, or the superposition, with all the numbers all the way down or whatever, right? And you apply this function to all of them, which will give you, well, in case you need that, whatever. Um, oh, that's wrong. That's the way the math works. All right, uh, I did them ahead of time. And uh, what you want to do is then after you do that, you've got this whole sequence in the superposition. And you can do what's called a uh, quantum fast Fourier transform, which will find the period of repeated sequences here, which happens to be four. Uh, right, so r equals four, which is the period. And uh, there's actually an old number theory problem that that's based on. And the fact that we just solved that in one step with a 
fast Fourier transform. It's like extra diffusion, sort of. Uh, what we can do then is take the greatest common divisor of n and a to the r minus 2 plus or minus 1, which will give us, uh, let me put a 4 in there, 50 for the plus, 48 for the not, which gives us 5 and 3, which are the original theories, right? Yeah. So. And you can do that with really big numbers, and it doesn't matter. So as long as you got enough qubits to support all that stuff. So we've still got to make really big quantum computers for that to work. But uh, you know, when we do, uh, you've got <laughs> you've got RSA broken. And uh, so, does everyone see how that fucks with RSA? All right. Then uh, this other guy, I love Grover. He made himself an algorithm too. And uh, he's just for oh, searching. And uh, okay, basically, he made a search algorithm that says, let's say you want to search sample space n. Uh, normally, you've got to search everything, so your average case is going to be n over 2, right? Uh, he can do it in square root of n, which is still in the same. Uh, Still in the same complexity class, but uh, hey, it's faster, right? Like significantly faster. Uh, the way it works is sort of do it up here. Let's say you've got yourself a uh, well. All right, those, you got a two qubit machine, and uh, those are your ends, or you know whatever you've got in your superpositions, and your. Oh, it's a search algorithm. So you're searching for a specific item. And, you, right. So let's say we're searching for like three, right? Or two, whatever. Start with zero. And uh, so the way it works is it works with probability amplitudes. Like I said, with uh, like it's really easy to find it, uh, anything in a quantum computer. But if you try and read the data, it'll destroy everything that you found. So it's like the find's really easy to do. It's just getting the data back out, which is the hard part. So find's easy to do. You found it. Piece of cake. Whatever. But uh, you still can't see it yet. So it uses what's called probability amplitudes. Uh, like I said, right now this has a, each one of these in EPR has a, one fourth chance of becoming whatever, uh, you know, one of those when it decoheres. Uh, so I'm going to 0, 1, 2, 3. I'm going to sort of label and make a little <laughs> graph here. 0, 1, uh, 2 is actually uh, 2, 3. They all start out like that. But then you can do a, uh, you can invert the phase of the found one really easy. Almost easy. <laughs> Boom. So we inverted that, like that. That's an operation you can do pretty simply. And then, what's that? Where? Oh. <laughs> yeah, sure. Like I said, I did this when I was fucked up, so leave me alone. Um, <laughs> so, what was I saying? Oh, right. So this is the fun one. You, you, do a, you, you invert the phase, and then you do what's called an inversion around the average. So one-fourth, one-fourth, negative one-fourth, one-fourth. That gives us what now? Fuck, I'm wrong. <laughs> These go all the way here. Because EPR... It's one half per bit, whatever. So you got one half, one half, one half, one half, and the average turns out to be one fourth, which is what I completely missed. So the average is one fourth, right? So you find the average, and then you flip around the average. So like, um, hmm, how do how do I put this? Like this guy's here, right? What's that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I just want to make sure people can see this. All right. 
So this one flips around to here, this one flips around to here, this one flips around to there, and this one flips around to there. And uh, since we've only got a four or two qubit machine, we only have to do this once, square root of two, whatever, one step. And uh, now our found one has a 100% chance of becoming our found data when we read it and it decoheres, and everything else has a 0% chance. And like if we had more, like a bigger system here, uh, we would have to do this approximately square root of n times of uh, those three steps, the uh, inverting around the average. But eventually everything else would go to zero, and the one that you had would go to one, and you're good to go. So that's fine and great, like for searching a phone book, you might think, but like you've still got to put all that data into those into the superposition, which is going to take n steps, so it might, you know, n square root of n, what's the point of that, right? But what this actually can be used for is, again, since we have massive parallelism of a quantum computer, we load up all the states with uh, all the numbers 0 to uh, 2 to the 56, and then we run a DS decrypt on all of them, and it, you know, it's one step, so it takes, it's the same as one decryption operation, and you've got everything on, you know, you've got every possible decryption, and then you do a search for the plain text, and you filter it to the top, decode your state, and you've got the plain text. So, uh, yeah, well, basically, you can brute force anything in square root of n with this dealie here. Yeah, any questions on that? Shoot. Is this a fairly low rhythm? Because I heard the past that I'm computing uh, help for uh, symmetric algorithms, but it only helps by like, reducing it by one bit to work faster. Uh, no, this isn't that new. Uh, and Peter Shor's algorithm certainly <laughs> speeds things up pretty quick. Oh, uh, she was wondering if this was a new algorithm or not. Uh, actually, recently he revised it, so there's uh, it's faster now, I guess, or a little bit better. Uh, did that answer your question good enough? So, it works. Well, uh, yeah, it's the same, yeah. It, you've got that one step, and then it's the search. So, you know, it doesn't matter. Uh, you. Yeah. So you're saying that this, this operation will in one step provide all of the, uh, all of the possible outcomes uh, of, that, of, that, of that key. And then you say you're going to do a search for the plain text for the one that has plain text. Right. Now... Well, it's not this operation. Like, quantum computers can do that just by stringing together controlled NOT gates. Okay. You, but you're still... All these possibilities is still a very, very, very large number of different possibilities. Right. You're still having to search through all of those for the plain text. So I fail to see how this really is helping too much because you're still having this basically brute force of search on the plain text. Right, it's still a brute force, but instead of a brute force of n, it's a brute force square root of n. What's a bigger number? 2 to the 56 or 2 to the 28? Yeah. Right. Oh, is that what you were asking? Yeah. <laughs> oh, right. No, okay, I see what you're saying. Exactly. Uh, no. Uh, uh, the, the, when it does its stuff, when it's magic, right? When it does its stuff, it does it to every single thing at the same time. Every single item in the superposition at the exact same time. It's massively parallel. So you can have it, let's say it was something that normally takes like five minutes to do, right? And you're going to do it on a thousand things. It takes five minutes to do. Okay? If you're going to do it on a million things, it takes five minutes to do. It's the search that takes the time. Okay. Uh, yeah. We talked a lot about how quantum computers can help break encryption very quickly. And I know that, you know, you go to the first time, but I think it's probably quantum computers help the only example I've seen of that is we did talk about the state is a beta that totally collapses. Yeah, that's coming up. Oh, yeah, do, do you want me to go to that? Well, I'll, I'll go to that. Well, you want me to go to that? I'll go, I'll go right now. Just one second. Okay. You have a voice 
Right. And, well, just quantum computers are very delicate babies, and uh, you don't want to be storing anything on them, really. Like, they got to put them in crazy underground places and away from electromagnetic radiation. Like, little disturbances will completely destroy them. Like, that's the way they do this stuff. The way they send something to an EPR state is they just shoot it with a little bit of electromagnetic radiation and uh, anything on the outside will completely fuck it up. It's 10 to... Oh. Uh, I'm going to go over this really quick unless... Do you want me to go over uh, quantum encryption? Or, uh, okay. okay. <laughs> this is a BB-84. Uh, it's made in 1984 by Charles Bennett of IBM and Giles Brassard of the University of Montreal. And, uh, all right, I'm going to... Oh. I was fucked up. Uh, <laughs> these are. Uh, this is Alice and this is Bob, right? And uh, so, Alice creates a random string of data first. Uh, someone start shouting out ones or zeros. I'm here. Oh damn. Okay, so. Uh, Alice creates a random string of bits, right? And then uh, she... <coughs> Alright, she's creating these in uh, photons. And photons can be polarized. Uh, and those are... Uh, these are the polarizations right here. That's uh, the up and down polarization and the slashy polarization. And this one and that one. And the ones can be one of those and the zeros will be one of those, right? So she knows what the polarizations are too. Uh, let's just make these at random also, but make them match up. All right. So she knows the polarizations, and she sends these out over the you know a quantum communication channel, like a fiber optic or whatever, and. Bob receives them. And Bob, he's got these two filters. One looks like a plus and one looks like a multiplication symbol. And the plus lets through the uh, vertical, horizontal ones. And the other one lets through the diagonal ones. So he creates a bunch of random, he at random, like randomly picks these things, a bunch of filters. All right. And the ones that work out great, they work out great. The ones that don't, you get some random thing, like maybe a zero. I'll mark it with a little red thing. Maybe you get a one. Oh, who's calling me? Uh, let's see, you get a zero there. Hold on a second. <laughs> Okay, so let me finish this up. Uh, do you guys see what I'm doing here? Uh, oh. Um, so, so long. All right. So I, I marked the little ones with the little thing in the corner, the ones that are wrong. But Bob doesn't know that yet. So then, what Bob sends back is. Bob sends back the sequence of filters that he used, or analyzers is what they're called technically. And Alice uses these and compares them with her set of polarizations that she used. And then she tells them which ones were right. So he knows that this is good, this is good, or he tells them which ones are bad. How's that? So they know the bad ones, right? And uh, okay, so then what they do is they use this sequence, the remaining bits, as their key. So, uh, and if someone's trying to eavesdrop, all right, uh, Alice 
creates all these bits and with the random polarizations. So I'm just trying to eavesdrop. First off, uh, the, by reading the decoherence will destroy the data. But even if somehow they manage to figure that out or whatever, they've still got to use some random filters or analyzers to uh, read the polarizations. And if they get the wrong ones, they're screwed. And then Bob sends back the analyzers, and uh, it's really hard for Eve, or the eavesdropper, to uh, figure out what's going on. Uh, I kind of glossed over that, but trust me, it works out that way. And if you, if you use a one-time pad, everyone know what a one-time pad is? Uh, everyone know they're unbreakable? Well, right, if it's totally random, like if it's a real one-time pad, it's totally unbreakable, right? Well, if you can figure out how to do that, and like nothing gets more random than uh, <laughs> superpositions, then uh, boom, one-time pad, great. Uh, yeah, okay, so uh, any other questions, or do you want to hear more about... <laughs> I completely skipped over complexity theory. Uh, any questions? Someone there? Oh yeah, the eavesdropper can get that, sure. Everything that's sent through, you assume that E is always in the middle and can figure out everything. But even if she gets uh, all the analyzers that were used, it doesn't matter because after the fact and she's already analyzed her stuff. So she's got you see what I'm saying? Uh, it, like it's a one-time operation, the anal analyzing the things, so there's no way to, even if you've got that information, it's too late. Uh, any other questions? I could understand three words you said. It was filter, results, and bad. <laughs> right. But the important thing is you can't use them again because it's already been read. Okay. Uh, anyone else questions? You there? Uh, well, uh, last I heard, they had a uh, seven qubit machine somewhere. I don't know where, someplace in California, in a Government? fault line, something. I don't know. I don't know how it works. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, what's that? Nothing there. Well, right. I got five minutes. All right. Uh, any other questions? Anyone? Someone there? Who's in the hand? Oh. <laughs> No, you guys can both talk at the same time. Steel cage match? I'll, I'll arrange it. Okay, what's up? Yeah. Yeah. What? That works for what? Well, no, not, uh, no. Uh, one-way hashes? Uh, if, if you do a one-way hash, there's no way you're getting your stuff back otherwise, besides brute forcing it. No, that's why it's a one-way hash. It's, it's more than a clever name. Uh, well, RSA can because it's based on anything that's based on uh, factoring the product of two prime numbers. What's that? Yeah, but then that has to do with uh, quadratic field. What? What's up? Yeah. Well, it, it doesn't matter because anything, anything can be reinforced with uh, Love Grover's algorithm, just searching for the plain text. So, yeah. But that's not as fast, no, but still, it's. What's up? Right, right, right. Yeah, I know. It's the same complexity, but still, it's a lot faster. What's up? 
Yeah, it's still Chrono Computing. You're still using a Chrono Computer. Alright, uh, anyone else want to say anything or? Alright, great. <laughs>